So me and my chickens have definitely come to an understanding. I go out in the morning and beg for eggs. They squawk for mealworms and don't give me any. I go to the store and buy some. Chickens are doing really well, though. All right, so like no hate towards this comment or whatsoever, but this right here, totally get it. How can farmers make money when eggs are so cheap? That thing of eggs I bought was 180. That's pretty cheap, right? I mean, relatively 18 eggs for 180. That that's a pretty good deal. With that being said, the quality on those eggs is kind of crappy to be honest. They're rubbery when cooked. They have a very light yellow yolk. They're not the best thing in the world, but my kids love eating eggs for breakfast, so I kind of have to buy them because my hens are little freeloaders right now. Love them dearly, but it's winter time. With that being said, um, the reason why I make money off my eggs if I want to sell them during the summer is because I don't sell them for $1.80 a pop. I sell them for $3 a pop for a dozen. And that's because they're way better quality than ones at the grocery store. They're amazing in baking, they're super rich, their yolks are nearly orange, and they're just a better quality. I also have free range hens, which I love watching and taking care of, so there's a pleasure aspect to it as well. And if somebody doesn't want to buy my eggs for $3 a dozen, then that's completely fine. I'll eat them. But if I sell a few dozen eggs at the farmer's market, the feed pays for itself, and, you know, I don't have to worry about putting them in my fridge. You can pay for your cheap eggs, and that's perfectly okay, but I'll stick to my fresh ones if I can. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go massage my chickens because some random person on the internet told me that if I do that, they'll start legging again, and I'm desperate, so ciao. It is time for the Beans Daily Weights. This is day one of Litter ID Alpha X2. 11.8 ounces. 100% survival rate. Great job, babies. All right, picking the kids up from school again, not driving. So when it comes to tanning rabbit hides, it's more of a pickle than a tan. And I can kind of explain that. So I prefer the salt and alum method, which is where you take a five gallon bucket, fill it up with water, salt and alum, and you soak the rabbit hides in there for a week, double the potency of it, and then put it in there for another week. Um, if you want a video now, um, Good Simple Living has an amazing video on how they do their salt and alum tanning, but right now I don't have a video. With that being said, as soon as I get about 15 to 20 rabbit furs in the freezer or freshly butchered, I am going to be making a video on how I process my uh, hides, so definitely stay tuned for that. Alright, so we're going to talk about this question right here, and I'm going to have to break it down into a couple of different sections, just because there are a couple of uh, thoughts in my mind when it comes to this question. And remember, these are my opinions and how I run my breeding program, and you can get an idea off of this, but it doesn't mean everybody has to do it. So I think the answer you're looking for is when I'm breeding a doe and she's kind of wore out. So when my does reach about three to four years of age is normally when they do that. And normally the way I can tell that is if they stop having really big litters or they start having two or single tins in their litter. At that point, I will remove them from my program and cull them out. Now, some other answers is, let's say I have a doe who for three months in a row that I tried to breed her does not take, I remove her from the program. Three strikes, you're out, I don't have time to deal with it. She either has done her job before, but is not willing to, or she's never done her job and I just don't want her in my program. I also have a three strike rule on uh, bad moms. So for instance, um, if I have a doe who is continuously having kits on the wire or she's eating and killing her kits, I don't want that in my program. Same with biters. If a doe is biting me and is aggressive, I don't want that bred into my program, she's gone. And then the last answer I kind of have for you is does I don't want in my program to begin with. Let's say I have a doe that I'm really interested in and I've been growing her out, but she has obvious 
body type faults or she has DQ points on a nose mark or nail color, I won't really, for the most part, give them a chance in my breeding program at all. With that being said, I have one doe who was given that chance. My doe blue doesn't have a nose mark. For the broken variety of mini rex, that is technically a disqualification. With that being said, she has amazing body type, and I wanted to see if she can throw me a self, also known as a solid colored kit, and she did, and he is beautiful. She's also on strike two to, though, because she does not want to breed. So if she doesn't produce kits this litter, or if she produces another no nose mark baby, I'll be removing her from my program. So yeah, those are my thoughts on does and when to kind of take them out of my breeding program. That is a nose marking right there. This is also technically a nose marking. In order for broken wrecks to be showable, they have to have this nose marking. This doe has half a nose marking, which would be a deduction. That little brown and white buck would be a DQ. Day two of weight checks for litter ID, Alpha X2. 12.5 ounces, they are up over an ounce from yesterday. Their bellies are still empty. Go babies go! So I just realized I never actually commented on uh, this question right here. So I'm going to give you a couple of tips to uh, find some silver foxes. The first thing I'd say to do is go to your local shows, talk to some rabbit breeders, and see if there's anybody locally in your area that are, you know, raising silver foxes. The next thing you can try is the ARBA site. Uh, you can search by your state and kind of figure out from there. Another great resource is Google and Craigslist. Uh, they're a little sketchier than the first two options I gave you, but it does work. But also be prepared to travel. Uh, to get my silver foxes, we drove six hours one way for a grand total of about an 18 hour uh, road trip because we had to stop for some snacks. So good luck finding some silver foxes. They Day three way check on Litter ID Alpha X2. 15.2 ounces. Each kid has more than doubled in size now that mom is producing milk. So I'll start with the easier side of identification. Um, if my rabbits are 12 weeks or older, preferably closer to about 16 weeks because the cartilage is fully formed in the ear, I'll tattoo my rabbits with an identification number. But where it's younger, I have to get a little more creative. For the younger ones, I have to get a bit more creative and that's because they're itty bitty and um, sometimes they're hard to tell the difference of. But it doesn't really matter for the younger babies up until about two weeks because I weigh them together as a litter. Um, all of the babies right now are a broken variety except for one that's either a solid or a booted broken. So it's pretty easy to tell them apart. I tell them apart by their patterning. But if I have a litter that doesn't have patterning or they all look the same, I have to get a little more creative. For instance, if I have a litter of blue-eyed whites where all of the babies are just pure white, I have to have some kind of identification so when we are splitting them up and weighing them, I can get a better idea of who is who. And I do that through either taking a little dot of nail polish and putting it on their butts. Or um, I don't know if you watch the, uh, the sheep farmers here, how they have the, the dye uh, that the ram leaves on the ewe when they breed. You can also use that to kind of tell them apart. Um, I've heard of other people using like ribbons or collars. I'm kind of scared of that just from a standpoint of I don't want to choke my rabbits. The last thing I need is to find uh, dead kits in their nesting box because of something I did for identification sake. So I prefer using a color dot method. Day four of weighing litter ID, Alpha X2. All seven babies are still thriving. One pound point three ounces. We are finally at a pound. The fur is starting to come in. This is actually super easy for me to explain. So I have two different sequences I use when it comes to tattooing rabbit. I have my show sequences, like these ones up here. So it's my barn ID, the generation, and then the color. So for this, it would be barn ID, generation two, lilac otter. 
Barn ID, Generation 1, Blue. For my meat animals, I have Dad, Mom, Sequence Number. So for this, Alpha is my buck, 1 is my doe, this would be kit number 10, so it's a female because it's an even number. And then over here, I have Alpha, the dad, 2 is the mom, sequence number is 7 because it's a boy. Day 5 of weighing litter ID, Alpha X2. All 7 babies now weigh 1 pound 1.5 ounces together. This first time mom is doing a great job taking care of everyone. Picking the kids up from school, not driving. So yeah, we've tried tractors before and um, where we live, it's not the best option because they have to be like extremely predator proof. And I'm not just talking like your normal raccoons and possums and all that. I'm talking like bears, mountain lions and bobcats. So yeah, we've tried tractors and uh, it's not been good. We lost nearly an entire litter to one of those predators. We uh, found two of our younger rabbits like running around and we were able to keep them, but it's not a mistake I really want to try again. But if you do live in an area that doesn't have very many predators, tractors are a great option for grow outs. Unfortunately, it's probably just not in the cards for us. Sure, I'd love to. <laughs> Dramatics. So when you first walk in, we have this long rail of rabbit. On top, we have our bucks. And then the next two rows are does. We use kind of like cheap casserole tin foil dishes to catch all of the poo and also the extra rabbit feed that's wasted by these guys because rabbits are extremely wasteful. And we give it to these guys right here, which is why they think they need to be in the barn at all times. As you can see, sometimes they like to get it fresh from the source. We have an incomplete rail over here on this side, which is where I have two, which if you've been watching my weighing series, this is the mama. And she's currently sitting in her box full of babies, but she's kind of looking for a treat right now since I'm standing here. This is Stormy, who should be giving birth within the next day or so. Today was her due date, and she's running late. This is the grow-up pen we currently have for our box. And this is our female grow-up pen right now. This is Saddle and Chessie, who are going to their new home on Sunday. On the back wall is where we keep our feed and my lounge chair, because I'm in here a lot. And then over here in our pink buckets, we have a mixture of feed, hay, and bedding. And then this is my only wood hutch that I have. I don't like them, but I'm going to use them because I have them. And it's kind of just a catch-all for all of our extra equipment and tools. And then I also have this stack of pet lodge uh, cages. I don't like the pet lodge cages either. I prefer my black cages because they're easier to open. But yeah, that's the tour of the rabbitry.